Good morning. Global Digital Human Rights Network is part of European Union cooperation in science and technology framework. We are currently uniting more than 100 human rights researchers and practitioners from about 40 countries. When the network was started about one and a half years ago, we were perhaps naively expecting that we will be able to address issues which are bright, forward-looking, and idealistic. But we have been called on several occasions to deal with matters which are dark, painful, and very practical. Today, the network will present findings and conclusions of a comparative study into how governments, legacy media, and private social portals have reacted to the Russian aggression against Ukraine. I am honored to give word for the opening statement to Estonian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Eva Maria Limets. Uh, dear Professor Susi, dear participants of today's seminar, first I would like to thank the uh, Tallinn University and the Global Digital Human Rights Network for organizing this webinar. The topic of our discussion is most pertinent as we are witnessing horrendous war crimes and crimes against humanity, genocide, perpetrated by Russia in Ukraine. Exactly a year ago, as I was invited to provide opening remarks in a similar setting on the topic of human rights aspects of the COVID-19 immunization passports, the world was already in turmoil. The pandemic had worsened the human rights situation in more than 80 countries, including due to restrictions on media freedom. Now, there are no more illusions where Russia's use of its propaganda machinery Long-standing and coordinating disinformation campaigns against Ukraine and suppression of free journalism in Russia was planned to lead to. Russia was creating false pretexts to attempt to justify their illegal and immoral acts and to try concealing all the atrocities they are committing in Ukraine. Mid-February of this year, as Estonia hosted the Global Conference on Media Freedom in Tallinn, Nobel Peace Prize winner Dmitry Muratov talked about the more than concerning developments in Russia. Last week, as one of the few independent journalists still remaining in Russia, Muratov was attacked and doused with acetone and red paint aboard a train in Moscow. This is completely unacceptable, as is the detention of opposition activist and journalist Vladimir Karamurza to silence him. There is no doubt that independent media has a crucial role in all societies. Media freedom, internet freedom, freedom of expression at large are the core for a free world, for a free mind. They constitute what democracy is and serve for each and every one of us as the foundation to make informed decisions. Clearly, though, it is not the case in Russia as by now the information is almost entirely controlled by the state after introducing full censorship laws and blocking social media. Therefore, the sanctions on Russia's state-owned pro-Kremlin channels is the only logical outcome in fighting their propaganda. Limiting pro-Kremlin Russian language TV channels broadcasting in Estonia has been a subject of discussion for years. But without delay, within 24 hours after Russia's full-fledged war against Ukraine started, the Estonian Consumer Protection and Technical Regulatory Agency issued a directive to stop access to five Russian TV stations and one Belarusian TV station in Estonian territory. The limitations have been widened thus far. 
it is encouraging to see similar decisions taken in a number of other countries. Protection of journalists was one of the most prominent issues discussed in the Tallinn conference in February. Journalists and media workers must be allowed to safely carry out their self-sacrificing work, particularly in times of conflict or war. As Russia is brutally targeting civilian population in Ukraine, it has also shown complete disregard to the lives and rights of journalists in blatant violation of international human rights law and international humanitarian law. According to Reporters Without Borders, seven reporters have been killed and 11 injured in Ukraine since 24th of February this year. Too many lives of excellent journalists cut short while bringing us the truth of Russia's horrific war on Ukraine. We cannot overestimate the true value of the information gathered by journalists in Ukraine. While they are reluctantly shedding light on Russia's crimes against humanity, they also collect evidence for future trials, for example, by the International Criminal Court. There is a broad global consensus that the role of media and internet is to first and foremost inform its citizens. The difference arises in the extent to what degree this information is controlled and managed. Estonia has the second freest internet according to Freedom House and is ranking in the top 15 on the World Press Freedom Index. It is clear that for us, ensuring the freedom of expression in all forms is of crucial importance. Russia can be found in the bottom of these lists and a large number of UN member states has recently once again deplored Russia's actions by suspending its membership in the Human Rights Council. Thank you and I wish good discussion. Thank you very much, Minister Limetz, for setting the context for today's webinar. The study which are going, we are going to introduce and discuss was initiated almost immediately after the start of the aggression. We have information from 29 countries and 53 scholars contributed to this study. Out of those 29 countries, 19 are European Union member countries and 10 are not. The order of today will be that my co-editors will introduce respective issues which were explored in the study. Thereafter, we have the possibility to listen to remarks and statements from three distinguished individuals and thereafter we have the floor for discussion. All participants are able to pose questions through the webinar homepage. Let us proceed. I'm now introducing my dear friend from Leibniz Institute of Media Research, Professor Matthias Ketemann. Thank you so much for having me. This is such an important study, and I'm very happy to present the first uh, two um, questions we've asked researchers. The researchers in our study focused inter alia on the question of what position their respective governments had on the EU-wide ban on Russian and Russian state state-sponsored uh, media, and whether a public debate had happened, 
had taken place in their respective countries. Um, we identified two major currents. Uh, there were a number of countries that supported uh, the ban quite openly and uh, a, not, uh, a not unsubstantial number of countries that remained rather neutral uh, or um, um, did not involve uh, themselves in the public debate. Um, we saw that the EU-wide ban on uh, Russian-sponsored media was widely accepted, and only a few uh, governments uh, took position against that, mainly outside of Europe. Public debates appeared rather restrained. The majority of our researchers uh, uh, could confirm that their respective uh, governments um, uh, and national media supported uh, EU activities against uh, Russian state media. Those happened either through national measures uh, by national media regulators or uh, through uh, or, or directly through uh, companies such as uh, satellite uh, providers. Some, some countries haven't taken public positions on the uh, media uh, ban uh, that might sometimes be related to federal structures where the uh, government could not implement the ban directly, but rather state media regulators were responsible. If there was a criticism, that criticism against the ban was uh, related more to competence issues. Uh, and uh, focused on the importance of free media and information rights more generally. Um, in a couple of European countries, uh, journalists' organizations voice criticism against the ban based on the uh, primacy of uh, the rights to information. Non-European countries, non-EU countries uh, like uh, Norway align themselves with a lot of EU sanctions against Russia, but specifically did not ban the Russian media outlets. Non-European countries like Argentina and South Africa uh, in our study uh, showed themselves to be rather neutral and to some extent um, sympathetic to uh, Russian media uh, outlets. The question of how to react to disinformation um, was of course at the background of this first question. The second question I've been asked to uh, provide a little summary for is related to the underlying question whether national researchers thought that their laws uh, against disinformation were sufficient. Now, the fight against disinformation is obviously extremely important in light of uh, current information, in light of the current information ecosystem. However, researchers uh, pointed out that national legislation uh, usually does not provide specific remedies for disinformation outside of specific circumstances, such as clear threats connected to disinformation or specific pieces of disinformation regarding a person. The more, um, the more intensive uh, uh, reaction, uh, let's say, or let's put that differently, the impact that disinformation has on uh, national discourses, however, is usually not remedied by national laws because uh, national constitutions and the constitutional guarantees for freedom uh, usually forbid intervention by uh, governments in discourses. Here, the European Union and its activities to fight against disinformation were pointed out by a number of countries as uh, important guidelines, uh, including activities like EU versus disinfo affiliated to the European External Action Service. Researchers in many countries pointed out that they believe the current situation was not ideal and that especially the freedom given to platforms to deal with disinformation uh, led to the uh, primacy of their, um, uh, their economic uh, interests over interests such as uh, national uh, social cohesion within countries. Um, the researchers uh, finally also found that um, in any uh, in any in any national way how disinformation is addressed, a, a balance has to be struck between the different rights involved, uh, human rights to information to expression, but also 
the rights that can be endangered by this information. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ketterman. We are proceeding, and uh, now I give floor to Gregor Fischer, researcher at the University of Graz. Please. Gentlemen and Excellencies, um, it is a pleasure for me too to be here today to present parts of this very important study. Um, the first one I'm going to introduce to you was the question uh, whether national media regulatory agencies have become active in the case of disinformation um, in, in relation to the war in Ukraine. And obviously, as most EU member states simply uh, did a transposition of the EU sanctions into national regulatory action. Um, that was the case, and uh, agencies in, for example, Austria, Croatia, France, and Germany have done uh, the communication of the sanctions to uh, the norm addresses, and so hence they have been very active. Um, some EU member states, uh, on the other hand, acted even before that, and uh, the regulatory agencies took an, a particularly active role in that. These were uh, Belgium, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland. Um, and uh, the most prominent case here being Latvia, um, banning 60 programs, half of which were Russian, already in the past three years, so hence well before the Russian invasion. The majority of non-EU countries, on the other hand, have not imposed any media sanctions. Um, there we have uh, the United Kingdom standing out as a counterexample, where the media regulator Ofcom has opened 27 investigations altogether against Russia today. And as well, the British Broadcasting Corporation, BBC, has halted all content licensing with Russian customers. Um, so analytically from that, we can draw three conclusions. The first being rather mundane and obvious, namely that EU countries transpose the EU law quickly, and so their regulatory agencies have acted in line with that. Um, second, um, the higher the geographical and ling linguistic uh, proximity to Russia becomes, the more expedient and far-reaching uh, responses have been from regulatory agencies. And third, um, countries, uh, for example, in the Balkans have displayed a reluctancy to impose media sanctions. Um, outstanding examples of that were Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Moldova and Serbia. Um, we can explain that uh, maybe through a historical tie to the Russian Federation. Another question that we have sent out to our participants was whether their country has a specific procedure in place for coordination with uh, social media corporations during times of crisis. Um, none of the surveyed states has displayed such a specific procedure. And um, national, national procedures rather applied generally um, and then to specific content or situations, which is um, hate speech and data protection and disinformation in connection with um, elections, for example. So a situation of crisis per se is not regulated. One state, however, Latvia, uh, managed to enter into an ad hoc agreement with YouTube to block the channels forbidden in the state, also on social media, uh, also on this social media outlet, most importantly, Russia Today, which I've mentioned before. Um, in our analysis, we have found that national laws enabling states to restrict media broadcasting were rarely used by EU states. So uh, the EU um, legislation has uh, overridden the national um, laws that apply generally. And we noted that the application um, of general laws in, in general is preferable to such ad hoc legislation. Additionally, and importantly, um, we found that lawmakers should bear in mind the dual publication channels used by classical media, so that, that these media also use uh, social media outlets 
So coordination with social media platforms is in order and important also in times of crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fischer, and we are proceeding. Now I call on Dr. Birgit Schippers from University of Strathclyde to present the findings of her group, please. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for um, giving me the opportunity to um, participate in this important webinar. I will also introduce responses to two questions um, that we sent out to our academic uh, um, contributors. The first question that we have asked uh, the collaborating researchers to address was whether governments uh, have proposed or taken additional domestic measures to regulate other social media accounts or media channels in response to the armed conflict in Ukraine. And the responses that we received uh, to this question can be broadly grouped into three categories. Uh, first of all, it's important to state that the vast majority of governments did not propose or introduce domestic legislation that would, was specifically aimed at platform regulation or social media regulation in response to the war in Ukraine. So this was the first group of responses. Um, the second response or the second group includes states, including uh, European Union member states, that adopted uh, the EU sanctions on Kremlin-backed outlets, Russia Today and Sputnik. Now, at the time of submission, when our researchers submitted their responses, these sanctions have not yet been uh, fully implemented in all EU member states. Uh, there is a small group of states, a small number of states, and they tend to be located within geographical proximity to, to Russia, uh, which actually introduced domestic legislative changes, for example, via amendments to existing laws in the case of Estonia and Latvia, uh, by introducing a state of emergency that extends to the control of broadcasting and social media, as in the case of Lithuania, or by conferring additional powers on security agencies that monitor the media coverage of the war. Uh, this was a response we received from Moldova. Additionally, there were several governments that asked their respective national regulators to ban or block access to Russian TV stations. And we also received responses which indicated that regional bodies, for example, regional parliaments in the case of Belgium, which asked the national government to take all possible measures against Russian disinformation and also to advocate for a stronger EU response. Now, one of the interesting findings that, that we received that there was very little evidence that governments provided legal argumentation that underpinned uh, perhaps a social media ban. Now, one of the explanations is, is simply because of the relatively low number of domestic legislative uh, responses. Uh, what we find much more was that governments embarked on political justifications uh, for media bans, and these tended to pitch, be pitched at a wider public, for example, concerns over Russian disinformation and propaganda. Where states introduced domestic legislation or amended legislation, they justified those changes with reference, for example, to threats to national security and public safety in the case of Latvia, concerns over incitement to hatred in the case of Moldova, or in the case of Estonia, to securing, and I quote, morality and lawfulness in the provision of media services. I also looked at the role of civil society organisations and trusted flaggers 
in reporting uh, online hate speech as a result of the war in Ukraine. And again, really interesting findings in that most submissions did not report a surge in online hate speech. However, this response or these responses need to be qualified insofar as the responses suggest a lack of reliable data. In fact, we only received two responses from Latvia and Poland, where uh, the uh, researchers drew uh, directly on research findings that documented online hate speech. And this was primarily directed at Ukrainian refugees, at nationals supporting Ukrainian refugees, and at the Polish and Ukrainian states. One other interesting finding that I want to highlight here is uh, uh, um, the refers to the actions of the anti-discrimination office of Styria, a region in Austria. Uh, they re registered an increase in online hate speech and offline hate print as well, which can be reported via an app. And I think this is something that needs to be monitored more closely and we'll see what results come out of this development. Thank you very much. Thank you, Birgit. We are proceeding. Professor Yuka Viljanen, University of Tampere. The floor is yours. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to give our findings. Um, I introduce also two questions. First, we had a question, uh, uh, have elected officials promoted contradicted bans on Russian associate media in your country or the EU? And uh, there seems to be wide consensus amongst the uh, elected officials that bans of Russian and uh, associate media have been appropriate and necessary. In small uh, number of countries, uh, representatives of opposition parties have been critical of these bans. Some countries outside of the EU have not introduced bans on Russian associate media and have based this approach on the argument of neutrality. Uh, on this analysis, uh, we of course uh, found that reasons uh, of this uh, consensus on, on this Russian uh, bans against Russians uh, were based on how closely Russian associate media outlets are to Russian state authorities and therefore are not considered to disseminate accurate news. Uh, and information, but instead providing disinformation and propaganda through the broadcasting. Even uh, some elected uh, representatives are saying that these plans are strengthening free and independent media. There are only marginal voices, uh, opposition voices that have been critical uh, of the actions taken. This is mostly based on this sort of idea of neutrality in countries like Austria. In some countries, uh, such as Lithuania, the criticism is more reflection of uh, the scope of emergency powers used uh, than the media fans in particular. Outside of the European Union, some countries have taken the position of being neutral and therefore do not consider it necessary to issue bans. The second question, of course, is also very important. We asked, uh, have there been specific concerns uh, uh, taken uh, on acting against incitement towards ethnic minorities that have been taken by the authorities. Uh, there has not been any significant increase of incitement to hatred towards ethnic uh, minorities due to Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine. In some countries, politicians have addressed that uh, there should not be attacks against Russian population and Russian aggression uh, should not be blamed on Russian individuals. And intelligence agencies have warned about uh, Russia using this argumentation 
as a justification for further aggression. And therefore reminded the public uh, that individual Russians are not to be blamed. So in, in our mind, uh, there seems to be no major signs of any systematic incitement of hate towards ethnic minorities to the war in Ukraine. However, in some countries, the politician leaders have addressed this issue and requested that no hatred to be expressed towards Russian individuals staying in their country. There are dangerous signs that Russian uses hatred towards uh, ethnic minorities uh, to build false narrative in their own state propaganda and as a justification for further aggression. Intelligence agencies have warned about this tragedy and reminded us that ordinary individuals with Russian background are not responsible for the invasion. Russian embassies uh, in some countries have used social media, Twitter, to distribute a message that they want to collect information about aggression towards Russian citizens or the Russian speaking population. This has uh, received uh, strong opposition from the local Russian speaking population. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Viljanen. And now last but not least, a few summary remarks from my side before we proceed to our guests. My group was looking into the question which was originally formulated, who acted first in initiating the ban on Russian and Belarusian legacy and social media? In terms, were these the governments or were these the private portals. Along with that question, we were asking whether private companies have made any changes in their standards governing traffic on their portals. However, in the course of the analysis, we were confronted with some surprising discoveries. To put everything into the framework, the aggression started on 24th of February, which unfortunately coincides with Estonian National Independence Day. However, already on March the 1st, European Union issued Directive 2022-350 which to be translated means that there is an imperative um, obligation in all EU member countries to ban access to these Russian TV and Belarusian TV stations. So the time frame was very short. Therefore, perhaps to ask if the governments were acting before they received this imperative from the EU is somewhat misleading. However, there were only five countries among our survey which acted within this relatively short time frame. These countries in alphabetical order were Belgium, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland. We are able to explain the latter four, I'm very pleased to see that Belgium is leading this group. After that, of course, all European countries have imposed the restriction. The legal argumentation has changed over time. Initially, one could not expect perhaps too deep argumentation, but as time has developed more arguments to justify the ban in legal terms, strict legal terms have been put forward. But what happened to private media companies? We have seen that with very few exceptions, none of the countries have reported that their private media companies changed anything in their standards. However, 
they changed something in practice. And what they changed in practice was to restrict considerably the possibility of portal users to post comments to articles or news dealing with information of the aggression. We have introduced in our study the term digital iron curtain. Perhaps it is justified to speak of this digital iron curtain and we can see that it is imposed now both by EU governments and also through practice from private portals. But what about non-EU countries whom we surveyed? Here there is no pattern, the situation is uniform. None of the non-EU countries we surveyed have issued any restrictions or any ban on Russian or Belarusian media. None of the countries we surveyed. My group was also looking into the question whether something fundamental may change regarding freedom of expression and media freedom in this terrible war situation. And here, of course, we received different opinions from the researchers outside of the European Union, but not only them. The idea put forward was to say that restricting totally certain TV channels puts freedom of expression in danger. And why? Because it opens the door for the governments in the future to misuse the pattern and start to restrict access to media in situations which prima facie are not as horrifying as the current one. We, of course, have countered this statement by saying that this concern remains rather abstract. There is no evidence that the governments would want to use this pattern in the future because they have not done so in the past. The majority of countries in the democratic world have not done so. What we also have discussed, and I am confident it will be a matter of debates in the future when the aggression is over, whether the relative weight between freedom of expression and right to disseminate information and from the other side, the value to protect national security, whether the relative weight is equal or whether there are circumstances that we can say the need to restrict the right to disseminate information considerably weakens against the need to protect security and guarantee factually accurate information. So in our study, we suggest that there is a need to further reconsider the relative weight of conflicting rights. But now I would like to proceed to the highlight of today and give word for comments and statement to former Estonian president, Thomas Henrik Ilves. Dear guests and panelists, uh, I'm honored to have been asked to participate in this uh, important panel, and especially in what is uh, so rare in academia, 
a panel discussing fundamental issues in media res as they are unfolding around us. Too often we look at such issues after the fact with no possibility to alter what happened. In this case, we can in fact calibrate policies in the immediate future. Ladies and gentlemen, freedom of expression is one of the cornerstones of liberal democracy overall and enshrined in the constitutions of all European Union member states. Indeed, it is a prerequisite as well as in the EU constitution, the Lisbon Treaty itself. For the purpose of this study, I think, however, we need to make a crucial distinction regarding the notion of freedom of expression. Historically, as well as legally, freedom of expression, since its beginning as a concept in the late 18th century, has been considered a human right, but it has always been an individual right. Liberal democracies cannot abridge the individual's right to freedom of expression, except in cases defined legally, such as endangering others or in a related notion, hate speech. Holocaust denial, for example, is prohibited speech as it is incitement to violence. I am dubious, however, whether this notion of the individual's right to free expression can be extended to state-owned, state-run, or state-controlled media outlets of the kind discussed in this study. Can we say it is a matter of freedom of expression if a state-run media channel denies or lies about war crimes? If it broadcasts speech inciting citizens to hate an ethnic group or promise its destruction? Is it proper to use the term freedom of expression when we talk about a state-controlled media outlet that itself denies freedom of expression where alternative or dissenting voices are denied any kind of platform? Indeed, can we speak at all of freedom of expression when these state-run outlets or <clears throat> outlets only permitted by the state while alternatives are censored and shut down? In other words, and briefly, does freedom of expression extend to states and especially to states that themselves allow no freedom of expression? And I think this is something that we will have to come to grips with already now, and I hope in the discussion we have today. But more broadly, I think that we need to clarify uh, also legally what we mean by freedom of expression, whether it applies to only individuals or can we extend it to state and state run media. Ladies and gentlemen, also, as maybe not the primary issue, but I would, <clears throat> in this light, I would also raise two other issues. One, which uh, directly uh, follows from the previous, um, obvious malign intent from Russian state-run media clearly form uh, a form of hostile actions directed at harming other countries and their population. Then one example. Throughout Europe and most saliently in Germany, Russian state media such as RT has vigorously promoted COVID anti-vax propaganda, propagating the absurd claims that we have all seen elsewhere as well. At the same time, these outlets rarely, if ever, promote the other side of the debate. Uh, I use other side and debate in quotes in my talk. Meanwhile, in the state-run media's homeland, Russia, the widespread and horrific effects of the COVID pandemic has led the Russian government on its own domestic channels to threaten those who refuse to get vaccinated with dismissal from work. To me, I conclude, like it or not, the Russian message abroad is tantamount to biological warfare. It is hardly an issue of freedom of expression. The second issue touches upon regional differences. Uh, I don't think it has just a, has to do with 
proximity to Russia, frankly. Those countries with significant Russian minorities face altogether different challenges regarding inflammatory Russian state propaganda than those with a negligible population. Countries such as Estonia have seen up close the effects of incitement and inflammatory propaganda in Russian state media during the bronze soldier riots of 2007. And today we see anti-Ukrainian hate speech on local Russian language social media. These issues touch on all East European members of the EU with significant Russian minorities, as well as Germany, which too has witnessed Russian demonstration in support of the war against Ukraine and the war crimes committed against Ukrainians. These are difficult issues, I must admit, but I'm extremely pleased that, uh, uh, that this panel has actually chosen to discuss these issues now in a timely fashion. And I hope that out of this, we will also get some policy recommendations for member states and for the European Union. So thank you for your attention. President Ilves, thank you. Thank you very much for these insightful comments and also the questions which you have posed, which are all highly relevant and I'm confident will be discussed today and subsequently. And what comes to the recommendations, policy recommendations indeed the report which will be made available today includes some of those, but let those be just the start. It is now my honor to introduce our next guest speaker, Director of Strategic Communication of German Federal Government, Irene Maria Blanc, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for inviting me to this most important and timely gathering. I'm very honored uh, to have been asked to speak and uh, thank you very much for the work that has gone into the study and thank you also President Elvis for your very uh, pertinent remarks uh, and what you said last that uh, uh, studies uh, and scientific efforts such as these um, should uh, uh, also um, uh, produce policy recommendations uh, that uh, uh, I think I can uh, absolutely agree. And we are looking uh, actually to the scientific world to help us do the right thing. Um, I am. I do not feel uh, up to discussing legal uh, ramifications of what has been said, but I wanted to give you an overview of what, of what we are doing practically, uh, which is something that we are always trying to adjust to the newest uh, scientific and statistical findings. <clears throat> we are. Um, using uh, uh, open source intelligent tools to look at what's being discussed mostly in social media, not so much legacy media. Uh, and we have been monitoring activities uh, of Russian state media, uh, uh, both in traditional ways, uh, as well as in social media for quite some time. Um, we are also monitoring, maybe that's interesting uh, in this context too. We're also monitoring Chinese media, uh, Chinese activities also in the social media. 
um, what we have noticed even before the start of uh, the Russian aggression uh, against Ukraine uh, was that uh, narratives um, uh, that uh, uh, pretended to Ukrainian aggressions against uh, Donetsk and Luhansk uh, that uh, told tales of genocide in Donbas committed by Ukraine uh, and also Ukrainian plans to um, uh, to regain uh, 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 atomic arms um, started to be played to the foreground to be to be boosted. Um, and after the invasion started, actually, that was not such a big topic uh, uh, in those media uh, as far as they were displayed in Germany. Um, main narratives here have been that uh, European sanctions are mainly weakening European economy, that German economy is close to collapse, contrary to the Russian economy, which is doing fine. Uh, and uh, something that has already been mentioned and is examined in the study, I believe, uh, that um, that's about aggressions against people with Russian roots in Germany. And as President Ilves has mentioned, there's quite an important community of people with Russian roots in Germany, about 3.5 million. Um, and we look when we look at what they are communicating on social media, uh, we can notice that they are quite divided actually uh, into pro and counter Russian. Uh, that is uh, interesting. Um, I wanted to, uh, as a Chinese media are interesting in that uh, uh, respect, um, because uh, we have noticed that increasingly systematically um, uh, internet uh, actors, influencers and such uh, are um, active in support uh, of accounts that are close to the Kremlin uh, and partly retweet uh, uh, and replay um, near exact uh, same statements. Uh, I think that is uh, interesting and we are, we are uh, keeping a watch on that. Um, that goes with another nar Russian narrative that's uh, uh, being hyped uh, in social media in Germany. And that is that Russia together with China and other BRIC countries um, uh, is uh, preparing to be, to be leading the world into a new world order. Uh, and that is flanked by saying, well, all the West has done is plunge uh, the um, global South into hunger uh, by starting this war, which uh, uh, leads to global uh, scarcity in foodstuff. Um, also interesting, and I think uh, um, with that I will stop this part and have only one little thing to add, is uh, that uh, this, um, uh, we notice very similar Russian propaganda in the social media in Germany and in France. Um, main narrative here is that the majority of the population is pro-Russian uh, and against uh, uh, um, delivering arms to Ukraine and against the sanctions. Um, another thing, and that's actually going to be my last phrase, I'm, I see that I'm my time's already up, if you permit me, I'm sorry, um, is that we are working really hard uh, to keep our information channels into Russia open. And maybe that is the only legal uh, thing I'm, uh, um, I will permit myself. Um, uh, President Dilvis talked about uh, uh, the freedom of expression. Um, I think if we look to Russia, our lodestar is the freedom to get information. We believe that Russians uh, should have the freedom to get information, and that is an assumption on which we are working together with media in Germany, with non-state media in Germany, uh, to try to find ways to circumvent internet censorship and actually keep information accessible also to Russians. 
thank you very much and forgive me for uh, not uh, staying within my time slot, sorry. Thank you very much. No problem with the time. It is important to discuss the matters in content. And now I will give floor to Louise O'Reilly, member of the Irish Parliament. The floor is yours. Friends, good morning from Dublin. Uh, I want to thank you very much for the invitation to be with you this morning. And I want to especially thank those who made a contribution uh, to this important study. Uh, I was very struck by uh, a remark made by Mr. Fisher in which he highlighted the importance of coordinating with social media companies at a time of crisis. And I think in a time of crisis, we reach for the internet, we reach for our phones, we look for information, and it's becoming harder and harder to disentangle disinformation from real information. And uh, I suppose for my part, I have worked uh, as a member of parliament with content moderators who are the men and women who view the content on social media. They make a decision on publication, they make the decision to flag in the case of disinformation or indeed in the case of harmful uh, content. And when I engaged with them, I got a very interesting insight into the attitude of social media companies to these people, to the work that they do. So I would say that, uh, you know, as more and more people get their news from non-traditional media sources, when more and more people get their news from the internet and from social media platforms, those men and women who stand between us and disinformation are extremely important. Um, and what I have learned is that social media companies, uh, not all, uh, but some, do not uh, treat the, these workers with uh, any amount or degree of respect. In fact, what they have done is they have outsourced this function. So the content moderating function has been outsourced from a large number of social media platforms, which means essentially that they are outsourcing that level of governance, that level of accountability and that layer of um, that that layer of um, personnel that will look and decide on disinformation. And I think this is very uh, this is very disturbing. What I found also is that these men and women are required in many instances to sign non-disclosure agreements and also to commit that they will not tell anybody outside of the company who it is that they are working for or the work that they are doing. Uh, friends, content moderators are our last line of defence. They see what we should not see. Um, therefore, their work protects not just uh, they, they not just protect us from harmful content, but their work can, if done right, protect us from uh, disinformation. So, in a time of crisis and in a time of war, we need to be sure of the media sources. We need to be sure of the information that we get. And content moderators. Uh, find, play a very, very key role in that. And the attitude, I think, of social media companies to this function tells us a lot uh, about the work that needs to be done uh, to ensure that, yes, absolutely, we protect freedom of expression, but we also ensure that we are protected uh, against disinformation, which is uh, absolutely uh, essential. Um, I suppose the when I talk about the, the, the content moderators, I always have to uh, to point out the fact that very often they are young people, they don't undergo specific training, and yet they are put in this situation whereby they are now an extremely important part of a an information machine, but also a disinformation machine. And this is where, uh, and I, I, you know, I, I welcome this study and the fact now that we are looking, um, and this conversation is starting in relation to, you know, the 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 role of uh, the role of media and the link with the state. So if you take that the social media companies have put their content moderators at one remove, the state in many instances put themselves at one remove. So there are different sources of information. Some of those are private. 
we absolutely have to protect the, the freedom of expression. And I understand that. But we also need to ensure that the social media companies are playing their part and that they're doing their bit. But we can't do that if they if, if the state is at a remove from the social media platforms and the social media platforms are at a remove from the content moderators, then you know it becomes even the, the site of and the chance to catch this disinformation gets further and further away uh, from the state. And that's why conversations like this are timely and important, because more and more people, rightly or wrongly, get their news, not just their information, not just their funny cat videos, but they get their news from social media platforms. And therefore, if social media platforms are to be used as a mechanism to halt disinformation and as a mechanism mechanism to put correct information into the public media and into the public discourse, well, then we absolutely have to look at the men and women who are our first line of defence against this content coming onto social media platforms. And therefore, while it is only a small part of the picture, the role of the content moderator, the attitude and the manner in which they are treated is extremely important because it tells us a huge amount about how what we can expect from social media companies when it comes to uh, combating disinformation, um, you know, particularly in a time of crisis, but also at, uh, at all times, but very much especially so um, at this time, particularly uh, when we see the proliferation of, um, you know, pro-Russian content on our social media platforms. We need to ask ourselves, how does it get there? Number one, um, is it correct, which in, in many instances we know it isn't. Number two and number three, how can we prevent that information from coming into the public discourse with a tag of respectability because it has come through a social media platform and the belief is that it has come through a filter. And yet we see the way that the people who act as the filter are treated tells you, I think, a huge amount uh, about the manner in which disinformation is regarded by social media companies. I apologise for going over my time and I thank you once again uh, for the invitation. So once again, thank you to all speakers. We can now proceed for a bit less than half an hour discussion. We have received some questions and also some questions which have been already voiced through the statements uh, today, uh, which I have written down and, and I would like to proceed with. Uh, first of all, we should not forget that um, the main actors in social media are not national companies, but these are global companies like Twitter, Facebook. So it is important for us to identify and discuss what has been the role of the global gatekeepers in this uh, time of military aggression. And uh, I will ask um, my dear colleague, Professor Ketteman, to comment on that. But uh, the other questions which uh, I would also like to discuss, uh, building on President Ilves' uh, remarks, does freedom of expression extend to states? I think that is one of the fundamental dilemmas, perhaps not dilemmas, perhaps there is a clear answer. And uh, the third uh, cluster of uh, issues or questions uh, could be formulated as, is absolute ban of uh, media channels which voice war propaganda and hatred, is absolute ban justified? One of the most striking comments which I received from our survey was something like this. Of course, we should ban RT when they are airing news and, and um, online discussions or discussions in the studio, but they are also showing sports. Why not to show sports uh, uh, programs uh, and, and unblock them for that? So uh, I think there are some very clear answers to that. But uh, perhaps now starting from the item of global governors, uh, Professor Ketteman, if you might give us a few insights on the role of global governors, online governors in this conflict. I'm afraid you are on mute. 
But that uh, just uh, goes, goes to show, you know, the importance of who controls the voice in, in any debate, right? Um, and it is just a fact that uh, communication ecosystems have changed so substantially over the last decade. Today, um, we are confronted with an uh, online media ecosystem where it is primarily platforms that have the direct opportunity to influence information and communication flows. Now, we've all heard um, the arguments that they're either uh, you know, too, too, uh, too, too happy to censor stuff, or that they're too lenient to censor stuff, or that they're uh, erring on the, on the right, uh, that they're deleting conservative voices or deleting liberal voices. We've all heard those debates. Um, but empirically, it is extremely hard to provide evidence that there is a, either a conservative or a, a liberal bias on platforms. What uh, we know, uh, according to a number of uh, reliable studies, it is that a lot of platforms have, and that's a good thing, an anti-disinformation bias. And it is also a fact that uh, spreading disinformation is uh, currently um, something that uh, conservative accounts do more than uh, liberal accounts, if you allow this generalization. So what we're seeing is uh, an increasingly strong um, uh, commitment to fight disinformation, and that is a, a good thing. Uh, it's also something that platforms... Um, are being pushed towards through activities both on the soft law and the hard law uh, level. Soft law, for instance, uh, the European Union has for quite some time cooperated intensively with platforms in different settings to fight uh, uh, content related to, um, to terrorism, terrorism financing, child, child exploitation images, and also more recently disinformation. That's a sort of soft law. But there is also increasingly hard law um, including the, the four big acts coming out of Brussels uh, these days, the Digital Services Act, the Digital Markets Act, the EI Act, and the Data Governance Act, they taken together will um, uh, responsibilize uh, platforms um, uh, substantially. Platforms will have the obligation in Australia to provide risk assessments according uh, to uh, in light of the rules which they have for sharing online uh, online content so they will be responsible to show exactly what rules they have and how those rules impact and including the recommendation algorithms that implement those rules how they uh, impact uh, individual rights and social cohesion and i believe that just as the uh, uh, corona uh, uh, pandemic was an important um, uh, stepping stone towards a more responsible platform behavior when it comes to regulating online flows. So the reaction now with regards to uh, Ukraine will also be, a, uh, in retrospect, be seen as a, a stepping stone uh, towards a more a responsible uh, behavior regarding uh, communication flows online. They're not being perfect, uh, no, but uh, we see that the realities of online uh, communication now um, uh, puts a huge responsibility on platforms that governments and civil society has to control through transparency rules, through accountability. And those are things that a number of the new European laws I've mentioned uh, provide for. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Matthias, for these comments. Now I would turn to President Ilves. You were asking the question, does freedom of expression extend to states? Of course, we could circumvent this by saying, well, the state always speaks uh, through individuals. Um, these can be state officials, but these can also be seemingly private individuals who voice certain opinions. Um, so what would be your own reflection on, on, on this question? Sometimes it is that you don't ask the question if you don't know the answer. Well, my personal view is that, uh, <laughs> that states, uh, states do not have the, the same uh, 
uh, rules on freedom of expression since they have considerably more power than the individual. They have a repressive power, which individuals don't. Um, overall, um, I would basically, I mean, I go back to Herder. I mean, I don't really think, I don't believe in group rights uh, the, the propagated by Herder and later by Fichte. It's, I'm strictly a um, Anglo-Franco Enlightenment fellow here. I do not think that uh, states, I mean, states have, have to follow rather, states must follow altogether different rules. And one of those rules is respecting the rights of individuals to free expression, which we clearly do not see in the case of the propaganda um, outlets in Russia or in other authoritarian states. Uh, and we should not give them the same kind of rights. And we should not talk about freedom of expression when we talk about states with coercive powers that limit the rights of the individual within their own states. Simple as that. Thank you. Um, anyone else would like to echo or, or, well, we are at least Having academic discussion, anyone would contradict, or we can proceed to other questions. Any one of the panelists, hard to contradict, I guess. Um, Mrs. Planck, I would like to turn to you. Uh, one of the comments uh, which you were making was, it is important to keep communication channels open so that people who are living if you will be on or on the other side of this digital iron curtain, have access to accurate information. Those of us who have lived in the time of not digital iron curtain, but real physical iron curtain, know how important it was that the flow of information was on both sides. People getting information and being able to give out information. So, could it be argued or countered that when we allow um, information, accurate information from the Western democracies to reach ordinary people in Russia and Belarus, shouldn't we give the same benefit to them that they go to TV studios, discuss their views, and people in the West watch them? I don't want to sound provocative, but just as a matter of reciprocal approach. Mrs. Planck. <clears throat> I, I hope I uh, uh, understood your suggestion correctly. Uh, I think our main focus is uh, to help keep access to information open also to a Russian public that is uh, subjected uh, nearly exclusively to, to state propaganda. And um, we are trying to help uh, people who want to inform themselves otherwise, who want to have access to other media, to Western media, but also to Russian media who are producing from exile. Um, uh, we want to uh, keep those information channels open. Um, if your question was uh, uh, on, on reciprocity, um, if you meant should we also, of course, uh, allow RT Germany to broadcast everything that happens in Russia into Germany, uh, the answer with, and here I entirely concur with President Obers, the answer is no, of course not. Um, and I think whoever wants to watch uh, RT Germany, for example, can still do so. Um, but somebody who is living in Russia uh, and does not have VPN uh, access, for example, is going to have an increasingly hard time to do so without sanctions. And that is something we are trying to circumvent. We are, amongst other things, working in the G7 framework. You know, we have the G7 presidency right now. Um, uh, on ways and means how uh, uh, free media, not state owned media, but media um, from all denominations, 
can uh, work together to to circumvent this kind of censorship or um, or uh, uh, wall, if you so want. And uh, yeah, and I, I think legally, just uh, the term of freedom, freedom of information, the freedom to inform oneself wherever oneself wants to inform, to to get information from is a, a very high priority on our agenda. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Uh, what I would add, uh, we have been confronted in our study and we have discussed in our group uh, how to justify an absolute ban on um, uh, legacy media portals and on social media. And uh, to put it in non-legal terms, if you will, Imagine you have uh, a violent neighbor who is violent towards his family and you, are know, and you know that the neighbor is violent towards his family, but the neighbor makes wonderful pancakes, tasty pancakes. Uh, you would not go to the neighbor to eat pancakes because the neighbor is violating something for which there is absolute ban. So what we are calling also in our study is to reconsider when, under which circumstances, there should be or can be, through policy recommendations, absolute bans on certain media companies if they cross certain threshold. And the threshold can be that these media portals very clearly advocate intrusion into freedoms and values which we, in the democratic world, consider absolute. Allow me to uh, pose a question both to Louise O'Reilly and Birgit. Uh, you were touching upon a very significant aspect, that in today's social media, the moderators very often are outside of the context where something is happening. It is being outsourced people who are moderating are far away. Might you perhaps add a few comments on that? Because I know, Louise, you felt that you were cut short by our time frame, but, but here would be an opportunity for you to issue some additional comments. And Birgit, if you would like to echo on that, please. No, no, the, the time was fine. I, I just talked too much, so <laughs> that was my fault. Uh, so, yeah, just in relation to the, the content moderators, I was very struck by something that Mr. Ketterman said uh, in terms of the communications ecosystem changing. And it's different and it, it's not uh, it's not the same as it was when I was when I was young. It's not even the same as it was when I, you know, a couple of years ago. So it, it's very fast moving. And, and uh, as part of my role, I'm, I'm a member of the joint Oireachtas committee which is the, the parliamentary committee on enterprise and employment and we had a session with the content moderators and and what really struck me was the extent to which individual members all parliamentarians but individual members of the committee who were not aware of the work of the content moderators they weren't aware of the uh, the structure within the social media platforms so if we're going to have any chance at being able to tackle this information we're going to have to deepen our understanding of this information ecosystem because it is very, very different. We cannot simply look at the masthead, see the name of the newspaper and know this is a decent publication because the information comes at us in many, many forms. I mean, it comes in a, a 10 second video on TikTok or a, a two minute video on Facebook or uh, through, you know, uh, Twitter threads. And, and so therefore the changing ecosystem, the, 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 the fact that the ecosystem has changed so substantially, but also that that change continues. I think it is really important not just for parliamentarians, but all, but definitely for parliamentarians, that we would have an understanding of that ecosystem, because without that understanding and without the capacity to be able to, to delve into these networks, uh, we won't be able to combat disinformation because we simply won't be able to see how that disinformation is coming into the public discourse. And we have seen this in COVID. Uh, we have seen uh, large scale dissemination of, uh, of disinformation. And we need to look at the, the, the what we use to stop that. But I think, yes, we do need to have that understanding because it, it's not it's subtle. You know, not everything that comes from uh, as, as I, I think it was President Evers that said it, that the, the yes, some of these programs show politics, but they also show sport. So it's not 
it's not as easy as uh, as simply saying this publication and and all that comes from it because the, 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 these outlets they don't just have many 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 um, outlets in different countries they also have multiple social media accounts and they use the platforms and they use them very cleverly so we need to be uh, able to look into that ecosystem to see how it works to examine that network and then to know where to deploy those resources then we know the content moderators as those resources they need to be adequately paid because if you're talking about silencing people and you're talking about disinformation and and freedom of expression then there needs to be some understanding that the people who are on the front line can be empowered to raise those concerns and as i've said with the social media companies putting the content moderators at a distance from themselves and often that work is outsourced and then outsourced again so it gets further and further away from the center and from uh, you know so therefore the voice of the the content moderator and all of the people working within this ecosystem they need to be able to express they need to be able to to vocalize uh, when they see disinformation or to to have that open dialogue and the system as it is configured at the moment certainly in 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 the in the republic of ireland the system as it is configured at the moment does not do that Thank you, thank you. Um, we are approaching, we still have now our last eight minutes, so uh, I'm changing the plan a bit and uh, yes, Birgit, I will give word to you immediately. We'll be able to give word to everybody just for the final, final comments. Uh, one minute, uh, not much longer. And please uh, address the matter whether you think the core principles of human rights, fundamental rights, have withstood this aggression, and if there is a need to reconceptualize anything. But starting from you, Birgit, please. Um, thanks. Uh, do you want me to respond to your initial question or to make my final, final uh, both, comments? Sorry. Both, please. Both. Both, right. Okay, so just in response to your, to your previous question, uh, I perhaps connect this with, with the point raised by President Ilves. Uh, of course, rights have historically been conceived as, as individual rights, uh, but states have obligations to res respect, protect, and, 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 and fulfil and promote human rights. And uh, linking this with the question about content moderators and about the, the, the wider uh, media, media ecosystem that we are living with, uh, these rights should, or these obligations should now extend to private corporations, including media platforms. And I'm, I, for one, am certainly uneasy uh, uh, by, by the power of media platforms and, and especially their ability to regulate what uh, conventionally has, has been a, a right and a preserve of, of the state and of those that we as citizens can, can hold accountable. So in, 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 in that context, I, I can move uh, on then to, to my, my final um, final comments. I think the, the concerns over, over disinformation and, and war, war propaganda are, are legitimate, but I think what we need are a very granular uh, uh, analysis and, and perspectives on the way that regulation and, and bans interfere with the right to freedom of expression and, and the circumstances and the conditions where this interference is proportionate and time limited. Uh, uh, and, and, and lawful. Uh, and I want to introduce just maybe one final point in the dis uh, into the discussion that we haven't really uh, touched on yet. Uh, so we're, we're talking about bans and we're talking about, you know, hard law that, that seeks to regulate uh, um, media output. But I think we also need to uh, uh, engage much more in the conversation about media literacy and, and political and civic literacy so that, that we can uh, critically engage with this information uh, even before we get to the point where, where, we, where we're even having a conversation about bans. So this, this is my final point. Thank you. Thank you, Birgit. Uh, Professor Viljanen, uh, any last comments, please? Thank you. Um, my last comment uh, goes to in this, uh, we are in this uh, very extraordinary situation, but uh, we should also think about what would uh, happen uh, in, in the future on, on this information. Uh, European Court of Human Rights uh, made a very important uh, judgment uh, just a few days ago in, in uh, NIT versus Moldova case. And one of the main thing I think 
at the moment would be that uh, perhaps now it's just like in, in the case of Greece, that European countries would make an interstate complaint against Russia. This is one of these sort of uh, time, we have now six months uh, uh, where we can still make these uh, complaints against, against Russia. So I, I think this is one of these sort of key moments for states to consider interstate complaint. Thank you. Thank you. I will turn to President Ilves and on a personal note, uh, if you allow, you have been very kind to participate in, in two webinars. Last year, we had the COVID crisis, you were speaking here. Today, you are a panelist in this webinar. So my personal note will be, we all very much hope that there will not be another global crisis which will prompt us to have the third study and discussion of something which is horribly affecting mankind. But always a pleasure to have you as a member of our network's board. Uh, President Ilves, please, uh, any final comments from you? Well, thank you. I hope you, I thought you were gonna say that you hope there's not another crisis, so I'll have to come and comment again. But uh, uh, I would, I mean, something I didn't get to, but I think one of the things we need to look at is actually the combination of state-run media and social media, um, which is that uh, at the same time that Russia has banned uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, and so there's no discussion. Uh, those same outlets continue to push and promote and uh, allow to appear uh, the Russian foreign ministry spreading some of the most obnoxious uh, uh, kinds of propaganda, insulting propaganda. The Russian embassy Twitter account here is brutal in its crudity. Uh, we don't do anything about that. Uh, and uh, I mean, I think there should be some sense of reciprocity that why if you're if you cannot, ex if Twitter and uh, Facebook are not available to to in within Russia, why should Russian state officials, state outlets appear on these things? But anyway, that's just a personal kind of uh, <laughs> uh, personal peeve of mine. But thank you. Anyway, thank you. I think it was a great discussion, and I hope we have more of them, uh, even without another crisis. Thank you. I hope next panel will be on more idealistic and, and forward-looking items. Um, uh, Gregor, final comment, 30 seconds, if you will, please. Yes, I'm going to be quick. Thank you very much for the chance to um, comment again. So um, I want to go to an institutional notion and say that as we see that the Russian Federation is now more than ever openly opposing the international human rights order embodied by the UN, the Council of Europe and the OCE, we should be reminded that these organizations as the guardians of human rights need to be protected. Thank you. Thank you. Real quick, Professor Ketterman, 30 seconds. Uh, human rights con concern us all, and we need to be aware that private actors have become extremely influential in deciding about how we can exercise these human rights. Of course, this should not be the end of public involvement. We need to make sure that there is a, a public accountability, that there is a control by public authorities and social and civil society regarding the way that private decisions impact how individual rights and uh, social cohesion are discussed and, and impacted by uh, communication flows. Thank you. We have the last minute. I would like to thank all contributors to the study, all panelists, all viewers. Um, we will make this recording available on our website. The report is already publicly available. What can I say? The sun will be coming out for everybody one day, the aggression will end one day, and we will stand firm and united behind the democratic human rights values which have brought us here. Thank you, and have a good day. <laughs>